Welcome. Get on in here. Sit on down. To the Stephen King Readathon, the great Stephen King Readathon, where we are going through Stephen King's uh, fictional universe and just discussing every book in way too much detail. And we're going to try <laughs> to not do that so much anymore, make these videos a little shorter, a little bit more enjoyable, not go into so much detail, and just talk about, instead of talking so much about the plot, we're going to talk more about like what we liked and just what we thought about it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I hope you enjoy Stephen King because that's what we're talking about here. Yeah, so if you don't, if you don't even like the guy, then get out. Turn off your computer. Don't even watch any other YouTube videos. Just leave. Get out of here. Seriously, we're waiting. That's it. <laughs> we're, we're waiting on you. Are you still watching this? <laughs> Yeah, dude, this is getting good. And it's right. different than I was thinking, too. Like, it's not just, like, one vampire in the village is, like, slowly yeah. going around and creeping everybody out. Like, this is this is crazy, dude. Everybody's vampires. Very quickly, it very quickly escalated to, like, a lot of vampires. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, super fast. Like, all of a sudden, actually, I was going to count... How many vampires are there in the town now? I don't even oh, know. I was going to write that down. I forgot. So we, let's see. We can there's... count through it here. Because uh, is who was the first one? Was it Danny? So, yeah, Danny is the first one. Right. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Danny's the first one. And we then find uh, out that Barlow is actually one. Barlow is, yeah, he's like the main guy that came to yeah. town. Um, and then there's... Um, Mike. Mike. <laughs> Mike, and then there's Dud Rogers is basically, we haven't seen him yet, but he's a He's missing. Floyd, yeah, he's, Floyd probably was. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's, in the, he's still in transition. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's true. Uh, um, the baby. The baby. That's crazy. There's a baby vampire. Yeah, that's going to be crazy, dude. Um, <laughs> so. Marjorie Glick. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, and how many is that? Six? Corey. Corey Bryant. Oh, yeah. So, within, like, a matter of days, there's already seven half vampires. Half a dozen, yeah, vampires. Nice. Barlow, he doesn't mess around, man. He plays for keeps. Bang on, dude. <laughs> we knew it. We called it, dude. We called it. We knew he was a vampire. We're pros, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so we left off last week. Uh, Matt, the English teacher, he invited Mike over to spend the night because he was feeling all sick. And then he heard noises upstairs and he heard a <laughs> sucking sound, creepy, and a child's voice. So then uh, the next morning, early, early in the morning, he calls Ben. He's like, Mike's dead, man. Come on over. So Ben and and Ma Matt, they go upstairs, they look at Mike, he dead. He yeah. like, he's like totally dead, but he looks all healthy. That's one thing I thought was interesting. When, when the person first gets bitten by the vampire, they're like very pale and sickly, but then when they die, they look all healthy again. Like maybe that's the exact transition when they're starting to come, become more vampire. Yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, they call well first Matt this is what I really I really like the character of Matt because he actually starts to figure it out and say it like it is this is the first point in the book where we actually hear the word vampire and he's like oh, yeah. like yeah this is this is the work of a vampire like I can't see it being anything else so um, the wound I thought it was interesting they said the wounds were gone and both of them were like well yeah those disappear when <laughs> <laughs> yeah, naturally that like, makes sense. Common All right. Um, <laughs> I haven't ever read Dracula. Have you read Dracula? No, I haven't. I haven't read it yet. It's on my list, but um, it seems like these guys, their knowledge of vampires is very much based on Dracula, and I feel like it's sort of taken as fact, and we've seen some stuff in these chapters that we're going to talk about where, like, 
it's kind of true. Like the vampires are afraid of crucifixes and like the wounds do go away when the victim dies. So sorry, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but anyway, so Mike Ryerson's dead. They call the doctor, they call the cops, the cop, uh, Gillespie, he's like suspicious. He thinks there's something going on more than what Matt and Ben are saying. Cause they're not telling everybody that they believe it's a vampire. They're just like, Hey, this guy was really sick and then he died. Um, right. Well, I, I like how the book g goes into that. Cause it's not like, Oh yeah, obviously this is a vampire. Like that's just common sense. It's more of like, well, that's crazy. Like, like in the real world, if someone was to say that a, a vampire came in, everyone would think they're nuts. So that's what they're like trying to figure out and like just tell the cops that. I, I just thought that made it more like uh, realistic. Uh, yeah, I like that too. It made it a lot more believable and realistic. And like, I liked how, according to the doctors and the police and stuff, like these deaths have a real cause, like a scientific explanation. They're like, oh yeah, it's, it's acute anemia. Like, right. you know, they're, they don't have enough red blood cells or whatever. And like, it's just, you know, it's, it is mysterious, but like there is a reason behind it kind of thing. So I think that's really cool and interesting. Yeah. I noticed a little pattern that like, well, just in, within these two books that Stephen King tries to make kind of fiction fantasy uh, connect more with the real world. Like in Carrie, he made it seem like it was just kind of a, a hereditary disease for yeah. telepathy. And and in this, it's more of a like. Well, I I mean, there's no real science behind this one, but maybe. But just like they do, they try to explain it using like what you said, like anemia and stuff. Really, I mean, if you think about it, if something like this really happened, most people would be trying to find a medical explanation. You know, it wouldn't. Right. Be, nobody would be like, it's vampires. Yeah. You no, know? so I I don't know. It's cool. I like it. Yeah. Then, then Ben goes home to go sleep, and then he's like, oh, I'm oh, going yeah, to meet Susan. I think that's where he was going, and then Floyd beats him up. And then Floyd, who, spoiler alert, he's been bitten, apparently, we think. It's, it's not, like, explicitly stated, but it's pretty, pretty obvious. Due to uh, the science, we kind of know, though. He comes, he comes dressed, like, he's got, like, rubber dishwashing gloves on and a wide-brimmed hat and an overcoat with the collar all turned up and stuff. And he comes and he attacks Ben. Uh, he beats him up. And then I thought it was funny that he beat him up and he didn't bite it. Well, no, he wasn't completely turned yet, so I guess he wouldn't bite him. But yeah, um, yeah. he actually puts Ben in the hospital. So Ben goes to the hospital. Matt, Susan hears that Ben is hurt, goes and sees Ben, and he's like, go talk to Matt. He'll tell you everything. So she goes to Matt's house where Mike Ryerson's body is still upstairs. And then they, Matt tells her everything. She doesn't want to believe it. And then, no, no, no. His, his body wasn't upstairs. That's what makes that part so significant. Oh. So the funeral wagon had taken it away. Okay. Actually, now that I think, yeah, that makes so much more sense. Because later, it talked about how he was in the morgue, or he was supposed to be in the morgue, and I was yeah. really confused. I thought his body was still upstairs in Matt's house. That, okay, never mind. That makes so much more sense. So Susan and Matt are, in the, are in, in the kitchen talking, and they hear something upstairs. Matt goes to investigate, and Mike, the body is there, like laying in the bed, but he's dead. And Matt's Wait, like, I, Was that right? I thought, it, I thought he was... Why, that's why I thought, like, oh, they just haven't moved the body yet. Because it said his body was laying there in the bed, like exactly where they left it. But it had the big, like, cuts on his chest where he'd already had his autopsy done. So, like, I don't know. Oh. It's a little bit, it's a little bit confusing. Anyway, yeah. Matt's looking at, his, at him, and then Mike opens his eyes and sits up. Oh, that's his right. His eyes that's are, right. like, all blank and empty, and, like, he starts coming toward them. And then uh, Matt, oh, this is another piece of, like, uh, vampire lore, I guess maybe from Dracula or somewhere else, I don't know, where Matt realizes, he's like, oh, it's because I invited Mike in. Like, you have to invite a vampire in. They can't come in unless you invite them. So then he's like, I revoke my uh, invitation. And I think he has, like, the crucifix. He holds it up and stuff. 
and Mike's like, <laughs> like very kind of cliche <laughs> vampire reaction, you know? Yeah. And then uh, he's like, I'll see you sleep with the dead teacher man or something like that. And he like jumps out the window and flies away. It's like crazy. Well, he falls and Matt doesn't see what happens to him, but like he disappears. Right. Yeah. And then later there's no marks at the bottom of anything. So we don't know what happened. And poor Matt, he's in his 60s, has a heart attack, which I thought was a really like just a clever thing to do as the author. Like what a clever way to get Matt to not be able to tell his story. Like otherwise he would have just turned around and told Susan like, oh my gosh, this just happened. But like yeah. he collapses and has to go to the hospital and like he's he's unconscious and can't really do anything or say anything for at least a couple days or whatever. It I don't know. So it's like suspense up until everything's going crazy. Exactly. It, it, I thought it was just really smart and like it was unexpected, but it made sense because he's old. He was all scared and excited and stuff. So he has a heart attack. So then um, what happens next? Well, this isn't too important, but like Susan and her mom have a fight. And her mom, oh. I, I hated her mom right there. I was like, yeah. what a horrible woman. She's just said a lot of mean things to her and stuff. Um, Without Ben, and learned, then Susan slaps her mom. Yeah, she, slapped, she tells her she's going to move out. Yeah, um, don't do that, kids. When Susan and Matt are talking at Matt's house, uh, we learn a little bit more about Straker, because Susan went to his furniture store, his antique store. And oh, yeah. Talks about how Straker was like carrying this huge chair, like a 300 pound chair, and he was just like carrying it around. And then he was like super charming. And I noticed it didn't really say it, but like if you if you watch Straker's character, all the men find him like creepy and threatening, but all the women find him like alluring and interesting and exotic. And I think that's another sort of vampire thing, right? Like kind of a trance like, sort of thing. Yeah, Dracula was like charming and very elegant and stuff, but he was also a dangerous monster. And like, you know, he would so just, just do you think that ladies and stuff. What's up? Do you think that Straker's a vampire? I still don't know. Because I was thinking about that. I was like, he maybe he is, but I thought that vampires were supposed to be like afraid of the sun. That's true. And Straker yeah. hasn't been acting like that. Yeah, that's true, actually. And we've seen that in this book. It's not just in general. Like in this, according to this book, the vampires don't like the sun, and we've seen Straker, like out and about. Yeah. So I don't know. But it's weird because, like, you be just said, yeah, because you, like you just said, he's carrying around that three hundred pound chair and yeah. woos all the women. So he's probably a werewolf. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> a hairless werewolf because he's bald. <laughs> it only grows out once a month with the full moon. <laughs> um, so then, yeah, and I, actually, that gets us all the way through chapters 8 and 9. Uh, but then chapter 10 gets, like, cray-cray. We see, like, three or four or five people get turned into vampires in chapter 10. It's crazy. I've been talking yeah, to them. It, happens, talking it happens pretty fast. Well, I just liked how... So I like how chapter 10 starts. It starts talking about the, the town as a, has like a personality, almost. Very mood setting, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was talking about like how it, like the town knows every one of its residents and it can see its secrets. And even when the townspeople like are doing things that they shouldn't be doing or doing things that nobody knows, like the town is always watching, like it's this, evil entity sort of thing and just right there I, I like that too it was it was really just an interesting structure because it named a bunch of stuff that had happened in the town just very briefly like um i think maybe we had mentioned it but i'm not sure years ago there was a big fire in the town and it like brings it up again oh yeah real quick and it mentions like this one guy who killed his wife and hid the body and then like it mentions this and that and this and that and like all this stuff that we don't know anything about. And then it mentions Hubie Marston again. Oh, yeah. Learn a big secret about him. Right. That he uh, was... Shoot, I forgot. <laughs> I forgot that he... 
<laughs> well, that's I'm embarrassing. Trying to, I'm trying could... to feed you clues. <laughs> I'm trying to get you to talk more because I talk too much. No, I forgot to write that in my notes because I know, like, <laughs> yeah, something to do with vampires, but I forgot the details. Every time, all these videos, my wife always tells me that I talk way too much and I interrupt you too much. So I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to get you to talk here. <laughs> And I failed. I failed the one time, dude. Um, <laughs> you set me up. And I it, it said it said that right before he shot his wife. So we learned that he did shoot his wife. Oh yeah, she was begging him to do it. He begged him to do it uh, because he made her do something or something. I don't know. And then she begged him to do it. And then before he hanged himself, he burned twelve years worth of letters between him That's and right. Barlow. Uh, but Barlow was going by the name Bryken or Breken? Bryken, I think, um, uh, okay. at the time, which we learned from the FBI earlier was Barlow's name before he left uh, Germany. So wait, wait, so did it say it in that part, like that Barlow was Bryken, or are you yeah. just connecting the dots that it said it back when he was? Well, no, it said it before when the FBI were like investigating him. They said, yeah, this guy Barlow. Uh, he changed his name when he left Germany. He used to be called Bryken. And then, and then we saw here with, with Marston, with Hubert Marston, he was burning all these letters. There were like 12 years of correspondence between him and an antiques dealer named Bryken. Okay. Um, See, I didn't make that connection. Guy. No? That's, yeah. yeah so, he, so he knew Barlow, or at least he was writing letters to him. Okay. I think it was pretty interest. Yeah, that's kind of crazy. That was, the, that was the big secret. Yeah, so we find out that. The big secret that I already knew, obviously. I just <laughs> wanted to tie to say some things, you know. Um, then we find out uh, Sandy finds her baby dead. Yeah, that was a really sad part, dude. I don't like that part. Dude, like, this, yeah. Sorry. Even, even if... I don't know. I hate Sandy so much, but like I wouldn't wish that on anybody. That just that's terrible. Like, yeah, she wakes up and it and it was interesting. I want to talk a little bit about the transformation process because we see little clues of it here and there, but there's a lot of consistencies. Um, the baby had bruises because she had hit him, but it said that like his bruises were all gone and healed. Right. Um, and then he it's like he looked perfect that he looked like super beautiful and all this stuff but he was dead um and we learned that it was danny danny came in and bit the baby um, uh, it's also briefly mentioned that mike ryerson this is what confused me about mike i thought he was at matt's house but then that wouldn't make sense why would they perform the autopsy at some guy's house so like yeah he must have taken him to the morgue and then he came back to matt's house yeah. um but anyway uh, Mike Ryerson woke up in the middle of his autopsy in the morgue, scared the heck out of the mortician, Carl Foreman. And then it's mentioned later, Susan tells Ben that Carl Foreman is like missing. So we're guessing he probably bit him and now he's going to be a vampire too. Um, yeah, Sandy finds her baby dead and she's like crying, she's screaming, she's like freaking out. And then the police arrest her, they take her away, they take the baby to the morgue, they take her to jail or something. They didn't really say where they took her. They just took her away. Yeah. Yeah, that was terrible. Yeah, because, like, you could see, like, even though, though she did all these bad things, like, she beat up her baby and whatever, like, that moment that she realizes that her baby's dead, like, you know, like, she still, she still has those motherly instincts that she cares for her baby, and, yeah. But I didn't like that part. That was hard, but I think the parts with... The Glick family, it, that's the hardest part about this book for me, I think. Oh, really? I, 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 maybe just because I have kids. Like, I have babies too, but like, I don't know. When I read about like Tony Glick and Marjorie Glick, like I can just feel like them. Like, I, I feel like I can really put myself in their place. And I just imagine what it would be like to lose two kids. Like, yeah. Back to back. And it's really, I almost started tearing up listening to this next part with Tony. It was just oh, yeah. talking about his depression. Tony's been sleeping from like 7.30 at night till 10 in the morning. And like, he's just completely like falling apart. He can't handle it. And his wife is dealing with it with a different way. She's like constantly cleaning the house, like super deep cleaning and kind of, they're both kind of losing their minds. 
Yeah, that's true. I don't know. Maybe it's just because I have a new baby too, a six month old. And so I related to that part a little bit more than this other part. But yeah, some some rough stuff in this book, dude. But um, <laughs> it, it does make it it does make it more real and more terrifying. So it does add to it. Um, so we learn in this part that something's wrong with Marjorie Glick. Her skin's turning pale, like she gets hot in the sun. All those little hints that she too is turning into a vampire. Yeah. Um, and She's then, exhausted. Yeah. And then it goes back to uh, Ben and Susan in the hospital, and they're they're freaking I just out. Want, I just wanted to say yeah. one about Marjorie Glick. I thought it was interesting when. So Tony wakes up, Marjorie's all exhausted, he helps her because she falls down and they start talking. And then, you know, he's noticing she's pale, she's tired, this, she's talking about how the sun hurts her and stuff. She tells him that she's been having this dream about her son Danny coming and visiting her at night. And like, and you realize like, he's just been so depressed and sleeping so much that he didn't notice that his son is visiting his wife as a vampire at night. And like, bit his wife that's a creepy dude that's it, it was creepy. it was it was such a really just a beautifully written like the the juxtaposition of motherly love but creepy vampire stuff like it was such an unsettling thing yeah <laughs> she thinks she's dreaming and the vampire danny tells her like i'm your little baby again and she breastfeeds him but then he bites her on the breast and she's like oh i had this wonderful dream it was beautiful like it was just like when he was a baby when he was teething it kind of hurt but it was off but it was great and stuff and like yeah. she doesn't realize it's a real vampire and it's like <laughs> sucking her blood and like you're like grossed out but it's really maternal and like kind of beautiful yeah. and, uh she thinks it's Pretty this tricky moment. yeah it is super tricky uh there's a lot of mind games being played by these vampires yeah yeah there is like just a lot of things that like the town thinks what's going on whether like other than what's really going on so so we see like ben and susan in the hospital again and they're seeing all of this go on at once and they're freaking out because ben is the one that saw like this to begin with he's kind of getting this idea of that maybe it's dracula and i want to just back up a little bit i i really liked how um uh, ben and matt were paired up at the first to like start this discussion because those are the, the probably the most two likely people to like start thinking about this how like matt's a, a school teacher he reads a lot about like this sort of thing like he reads i don't know Don't fantasy me. and all that stuff and then ben's a book writer like with this history at the Marston house sort of thing. So I, I just feel like if it was any, uh, anybody else um, seeing these coincidences or seeing that like uh, Mike was dead upstairs, they'd be like, oh yeah, he's dead. He got anemia or something. But these right, guys, yeah. what? They wouldn't really think too much of it. They would think it was weird, but yeah like, that's it and then just move on but these guys are like well these are i guess more educated people like they've read well-read people they've they see all this or heard all this other thing all these other things and they're like they're putting the clues together interesting yeah yeah if floyd tibbetts got arrested after he beat up ben they throw him in the in the drunk tank and then right. they go to feed him breakfast and he's asleep they come back for lunch he's still asleep and they're like, what's going on? And they try to wake him up and he's dead. He's all pale and he's dead. So it's like, I was expecting him to wake up and bite the cops. But then uh, the senior officer, the sheriff guy, Gillespie, he's like, let's get out of here. He reckon he knows something's going on. He just doesn't know what it is. Yeah, I, like, yeah. I like him as a character because he's like, he's suspicious. He knows there's something weird, but he quite can't quite put his finger on it because he's not an educated English teacher slash author, I guess. Right. <laughs> but yeah, uh, he which, tells uh, his yeah, deputy, yeah. he's like, "Let's get out of here!" And they just, they just take off. They like, I think they lock Floyd in the cell, and they take off. Which I'm really curious. 
what's going to happen with Floyd? Like, if he's a vampire, but he's trapped in the cell, will he be able to get out? Or is he, are they going to be able to, like, keep him captured in there or what? I don't know. It's interesting. That's true. Turns into a bat, flies away, or a rat. Oh, that was, a, that was another thing. Um, actually, just right after that, a couple guys go to the dump. They're going to dump some trash, and they notice there are no rats anywhere. Normally, there's, like, rats all over the place. There's right. no rats. I think it's interesting. Yeah, I like I liked those guys as characters. They were kind of <laughs> they're just gross, dude. They're like both. one guy goes to spit out the window and he realizes that the window is closed. So he just like <laughs> smears it because they're so drunk. So they go to the dump to dump all their like they have a full bed of empty alcohol cans, beer cans, like vodka bottles, wine pitchers, everything. Uh, yeah. And it Cakes. said they go, they go do that like once a month, right? Yeah. <laughs> Every month they dump <laughs> like a guys... truckload of empty alcohol containers. Like that's yeah. how much they're drinking. You guys are in hell in it. Um, yeah. So they go there. Then they realize, like I was saying, that there's something going on. There's no rats there or anything. And they it's go, closed. And it's closed. It's so they just ram the gate. But that's that yeah. they're for. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> it's closed? All right. We don't care. They just crash through the gate. Like, they're like angry that it's closed. It's supposed to be open. Burn. They're like super drunk. They're both like drinking while driving and just crash through the gate. <laughs> yeah, it was so funny, dude. Yeah, I enjoyed that part. <clears throat> and then we, because we saw earlier, a couple of chapters ago, last week's discussion, that uh, somebody, we thought it was Barlow, which I think it right. was, turns out it was, um, went and visited Dud Rogers, the guy who runs the dump and like was hypnotizing him and stuff. So these guys, they go, I thought they were going to get turned to vampires. They, uh, they find Dud Rogers little hut where he lives. It was locked from the inside. They break in and no one's there. So That's how was it locked from the inside? We don't know. No, we did not. Well, we might find out, but not yet. Maybe he turned into a bat and flew out the window. True. All these vampires turn into bat, bats. And then we go to Corey and Bonnie. Haven't seen them in a while. Yeah. So they're the ones that were having an affair before the, the cable kid. Phone um, company, yeah. Yeah. So they're they're doing the or getting ready to do the dirty. Do the devil's tango. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and they think that the husband's out of town, but, but he's standing there in the doorway with shotgun. Yeah. This was, this and, part was pretty intense. Yeah, it was. And, and it was non, it was, it was the most intense, not vampire related part of the book. Right. Yeah. So, so it was kind of a nice little break from vam vampires and everything to more serious, realistic, real world stuff. And we jump back into vampires, but yeah. So the husband, he's there with shotgun. He's like threatening Corey. Corey? Yeah, Corey. Corey. Yeah. He like puts the shotgun in his mouth. He's talking to him. And he like pulls the trigger and nothing happens because the, the gun was empty. Yeah. And Corey like pees his pants and poops his pants. And yeah. Yeah. Pretty intense. It was very intense. It was great. I thought he was going to kill him for sure. Oh, I know. I know. Um, yeah, so then Corey's walking down the road, kind of like just delirious and in shock. And then Barlow. The, the husband, Reggie, tells him to like get out of town. To, oh, yeah. If he ever sees him again, he's going to kill him. He tells him, go get a bus, leave town. Nah, I, don't, I don't ever want to see you again. That's right. So he's leaving, getting out of town. He's walking down the road. And he meets up with Barlow. Dun, dun, dun. And then this is where we find out that he's a vampire. I love you say, I love how you say dun, dun, dun so casually. With Barlow, <laughs> dun, dun, dun. And that's when we find out. <laughs> well, because everything's creepy in here. There's, there's yeah. it's just a lost cause anymore. <clears throat> yeah. He, he, yeah. He, he kind of hypnotizes this Corey kid. So Corey, he's talking about like, okay, I'm going to get my savings. I'm going to move. I'm going to find a job, blah, blah, blah. And then 
Barlow comes and sort of hypnotizes him and convinces him to stay. So I'm thinking there's going to be a confrontation with Corey and the, the husband, Reggie, that he's going to see him again and try to attack him. But then now Corey's going to be a vampire and he's going to fight Reggie or just kill him. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's going to be guessing. interesting. There's so many different like conflicts and relationships in this book that makes it really dynamic. Or yeah. like that. Instead of just one plot, like with one character that's going forward. It's like all these side stories that are going on at the same time as well. Yeah, and if you think about it, I mean, it would be so easy for this book to be kind of boring. Because, yeah. I mean, if it was just one vampire terrorizing the town, I mean, that, that could be a good story, right? But the way he goes about it is like this vampire is turning everybody else into vampires. And so that's cool. But then it could be a really boring thing where it's like, well, he just became a vampire, then he became a vampire, then he became a vampire. But, like, he sets it up where these characters have conflict with each other and have relationships, and then one becomes a vampire and one doesn't. Or, like, you know, this one becomes a vampire. Like, the kid becomes a vampire and turns his own mom. And, like, yeah, all yeah. these different things. You're totally right. It's, it's very dynamic, and, like, it prevents it from being too repetitive. It's not just the same story here as here as here as here as here. They're all, they're all individual. They're all very unique. It's really cool. I like it. Yeah, it just makes it so much more suspenseful because you don't know what's going to happen because now anything can happen, you know? Like yeah. if, a, if a kid's making his, like, mom a vampire, well, what else could happen, you know? Just Especially, I think the crazy one is the baby vampire. The baby, like, yeah, I know. I mean, I'm wondering at, what's going to happen with that. At 10 months, most kids can't even walk yet. Like, and if they can, they're pretty unsteady. Like, how... What is a baby vampire gonna be like? Like, can it walk? Can it fly? Like, what's I don't know. I'm oh, I'm really right. intrigued. Yeah. Have, do I you wonder. Ten months. None of my kids walk that early. I don't know. Maybe I'm no. just. That's my experience. No, but crawling around. I'm just wondering if like somehow, it goes back to the mom, Sandy, because she. She was like, oh, yeah, my child's dead or something, like, totally in shock. Then the police just take her away. So I wonder if it comes back, and then the doctors are like, well, we thought that it was dead, but it really wasn't, and then some kills Sandy or something. Oh, I see. Well, uh, yeah, well, I get I, I mean, I'm sure we're going to see what's going to happen, because later on, right at the end of this chapter, almost at the end, we see two... Um, I don't know if they're morticians or they're like interns or something like two employees yeah, morticians. work and uh they they find there's like two open uh those drawers where they keep the bodies there's two right. of them that are open and they're like what's going on and they check and there's paperwork for floyd tibbetts because he died and randy mcdougall the baby but the bodies are missing so like they've awoken awakened awoken i don't know they're awake <laughs> And uh, they're walking around, they're vampires, and like, I guess, but, so the baby is out there somewhere, it got away, it's a vampire baby, I can't wait to see what it is. <laughs> I like how the morticians, they don't have any idea of what's going on, like, they haven't dealt with any of this, they're just like, oh crap, we're in trouble, we've lost two bodies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they have zero clue, they don't know who, they, well, they're in another town, they're in Portland, yeah, uh, they said it was like the county morgue or something like that. So they don't even know who these people are or anything about <laughs> them. So they're just like, oh crap. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot, we, we lost them. Like, dead bodies. That's not good. It's not good <laughs> for business. And then the chapter ends. We go into Mark Tibbetts. No? No, Mark, no. Uh, Mark Petrie. Petrie. Mark Petrie's room. You tell us, Mark. This was so creepy. This was good. Yeah. So Mark wakes up in this dark room. He's not sure why he wakes up. And he looks over at the window, and Danny's there looking through the window. Oh! And Danny's like, hey, let me come in. Let me come in. I want to come in. And he has, he, has, and in. he has something, like, muddy looking around his face, like dark reddish brown all over his mouth. Yeah. And so... Uh, I can't remember exactly. 
you you say it in detail because you're you're way better than that dude. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, Danny's I mean, sorry, Mark's room is on the second story, right? And there's right. no ledge or anything, so he's like, "What the heck is going on?" Um, and yeah, he basically just sees him floating outside, and then uh, Danny, the vampire kid, is like, "Let me in! Open the window! Let me in!" And uh, Mark says that he's not sure if he was actually saying it, he was hearing him, or if he was like just like hearing it in his mind. So he's sort of like communicating to him. And again, as we've seen, oh yeah, I was going to talk about like the the process of transformation and like what the powers of a vampire, the characteristics. Mm -hmm. um, every time, well, almost every time we see a character meet a vampire, they if they look him in the eyes, they start to get hypnotized. I think that's a kind of a cool, and the way he describes it is really nice. He never says like, "Oh, they just got hypnotized." He just says that <laughs> things make sense when they're looking in their eyes, and like the the pain, you know, goes away, and like things are just nicer. And like uh, Corey, when he was gonna get on the bus and leave town, when he saw Barlow, it talks about how like, no, I don't need to leave town. Like everything just started like he wasn't scared anymore, and like all this stuff, you know, like just really put him at ease um it's like a calming feeling sort of thing yeah very very much so and um so mark starts to feel this with with danny in the window a little bit but then he's like he mark he's like a 12 year old kid and he's more prepared than anybody else in the town because he's into these horror uh comics and shows and stuff so he's like oh no and he, he won't look he's like that's how i get you <laughs> and then he turns and he sees his little set of action figures and horror figurines and stuff. And there's a gravestone in the shape of a, a cross, like a, like a little plastic cross, crucifix. Right. And, uh, and he knows he has to invite Danny in for Danny to be able to get in. Danny keeps telling him, let me in, let me in. And he's starting to get like agitated. agitated. And so, uh, so he grabs the crucifix and I'm sitting there thinking, like, oh, he's going to turn around and just show it to him. And, like, Danny's going to get scared and run away. But Mark invites him in. Yeah, that's like, what I thought was crazy. I was like, what What are you I doing, think, kid? Like, you're you prepared read that? and everything. Like, like, oh, you know, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was scared for Mark. So he's like, come on in then. And Danny gets all happy, and he opens the window, and he comes flying in the room. And Mark turns, and he, like – bashes him in the face presses this plastic crucifix up against danny's face and i was sort of thinking like that's just a plastic toy like it's not gonna do anything but it did it burned him and like mark could feel the flesh like sinking in like giving way it was like pressing into his face and stuff and danny screams and is like it burns him really bad and then he flies out the window and into the night and then, of course, uh, Mark's dad comes upstairs to check on him because he heard a scream. And Mark's just like, I'm cool. Nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nothing out of the ordinary, Dad. I guess I just had a bad dream. And, like, it's ridiculous that Mark just plays it so cool. And Well, I like how he described it at the end of this book, like the difference between kids and adults. Like, yeah. He was talking about how, um, as kids, you're always deal dealing with that that unconquerable fear of like there's a monster under your bed or there's that dark shadow in the closet or something's going on so you always are dealing with that sort of thing and and like you go to sleep every night and you just learn to kind of slowly overcome that so as uh, as kids like as uh mark he just kind of fell asleep just he was okay and just fell right asleep just because like this is one of those sorts of things where he just always deals with fear and this was another crazy fear thing of just it doesn't make any sense neither does the monster under your bed but that's just what it is i thought that was interesting and kind of funny even how he said like danny uh sorry mark petrie the kid he's laying in bed and he's like adults the only fears they have to deal with is like do i have enough money or in like, you know, can I, you know, am I going to lose the house or can I get that job? He's like, us kids worry about like, 
being mutilated and killed and eaten every <laughs> night by whatever's waiting in the dark closet. Right. Like, it's like the fears of a child are so much more intense than the fear of an adult. So yeah, I thought that was an interesting kind of perspective and a twist on it where the kid is used to it and he handles it so much better than all the adults in the story. Yeah. You know what, what's actually kind of scary is, so I was just reading that part probably like an hour and a half ago or something. And Presley came out and she's like, dad, I'm scared. I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> There's a vampire in your room. <laughs> There's someone outside my window. Yeah. But it just kind of, it also kind of made me think of like, yeah, I mean, I'm sure that is terrifying for kids because they don't know the real world. Like, they haven't lived in it for long enough. So I don't know if there's, like, that monsters aren't real. Like, we have to constantly tell them that they're not. But, like, that stuff could be possible, you know? Definitely so, to them it is, yeah. Yeah. So as an uh-huh. adult, if that sort of thing were to happen, that would be so terrifying. It would, like, confirm everything. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, from your childhood. Yeah, that would be terrifying. That'd be horrible. <laughs> um, we, you know, we we we've been in this new house for a couple of months, and my three year old, she's constantly waking up at night. Like almost every night, she wakes up and wants to come to our bed because she's like scared of something. And as an adult, you're just like sick of it sometimes. You're like, oh, go back to bed. You almost want to, you know, get angry. Um, right. right. I've been good about it, trying to stay calm and just take her back to her bed and comfort her and stuff. You know, but um, but yeah, just looking at it from their perspective, they don't know like that everything's okay here. You know, yeah. it's a new place. It's got this place is bigger than where we were. It's got a lot more shadows, a lot more, you know, corners and stuff. So I don't know. It's I'm it's scary for her for sure. Right, a little more eye opening. I don't know. I think reading this book has been kind of a little bit more eye-opening in that sort of sense. I know that sounds silly, but you're, you just kind of think, yeah, those fears, even though they seem stupid to us, are very real to them. Speaking of kids, I've been wondering, like this whole book, basically, who is the kid in the prologue? And I was thinking that maybe it was Danny, um, but now I'm starting to think, I think maybe it's Mark. I, I think Mark is smart enough and prepared enough. I think he's going to get through this unscathed. That no, he's not going to get bitten by a vampire. And him and Ben, I think the prologue is Ben and Mark. I think they're going to escape the town together. They're going to be like the last people in the town left. Yeah. They're going to escape together, run away to Mexico, and then come back later to do whatever. I don't know what's going to happen. At the end of the prologue, he said he was going to come back to Salem's Lot. So we'll see. I don't know what that's about. Yeah. No, that's interesting. I didn't even think about that. Kind of been in the back of my mind, like wondering, I'm still wondering who are these people from the prologue, but I, I think it's Ben and I think it's, I think maybe it's going to be uh, Mark Petrie is the kid. Which means that's kind of sad. Susan gets killed off. I, I don't know. Do Probably. Think so? I think. Well, well, if it's just him and, and Mark. If like yeah, that theory is true, then why would he be with Mark and not Susan? Yeah. My idea comes is true, then yeah, she's she's a goner. I loved I the most intense parts I thought were when Reggie Sawyer was gonna kill Corey Bryant for sleeping with his wife. It was really intense. And then uh and also when Danny visited Mark, I thought that was cool. It was a cool part. Yeah. Yeah, those are super creepy dude. Um yeah, I think those are probably my scary parts. And then, and then the just like there's a feeling of maybe not scary but dread when they when the baby died when the baby was dead. Oh yeah, yeah. But, um, so the poem at the beginning, the Emperor of Ice Cream. Oh yeah, I thought that was interesting. So I looked it up. I kind of looked at the meaning of everything, and it's basically just a poem about. Um, how in life death happens and lots of people try to dress it up as it's it's like they're still alive sort of thing but it was kind of talking about how it was just saying like let it be as it is like she's cold and she's dead like shine the lights on her don't make it all this 
this thing that it's not like she's dead and that's just what happens part of life i found that kind of interesting it's kind of uh, it would be a joy at a funeral yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but i'm gonna when when you die that's what i'm gonna say at your funeral i'm gonna, okay. I'm gonna speak even if they don't want me to okay up there i'm gonna be like hey no, i give you permission right now be like hey get over it he's dead okay <laughs> Move on. Stop pretending. Yeah. He, he got Did decapitated you in, in a random uh, watermelon shooting contest. So, what? you know, it was life. <laughs> those, th those things happen, you know? <laughs> I'm just going to tell him that. I'm be like, okay. Get, okay. Dead. Get over it. Good. Move yeah. On. Just help him, help him move through the grieving process just like a lot faster. So oh, I'll get, we'll get through the grieving process like that. Okay. Oh, one last thing. So Susan, when they're when Ben's talking to her, he's talking about um, how evil, like how the Marston house he feels is evil. And Susan says this thing. She says, uh, she do, oh she doesn't feel that there's like evil in the world. It's just evil dies with evil acts." Yeah, it's people yeah. that do evil things, and when those people die, that evil is gone. Right. I was wondering your thoughts on that. Do you? What do you think? Is, is there like? Do you think there can be evil objects, like in an objects, or is it just like there's only evil people, and when like, and they'll do evil things, but but there's not like a there's not evil. Uh, presence like a house can't be evil in and of itself i i don't believe that an object can be evil or be so like, a, be like like a, possessed or anything like that like, like a house couldn't be evil yeah like all these scary movies of haunted houses and like annabelle the possessed doll and stuff mm -hmm. um i don't believe in anything like that i do believe in like evil spirits but i don't believe that they are like people who have lived and then died and then like stuck around i think if you live on this earth and you die like your spirit moves on um but i believe that like the evil influence of like satan and like spirits and stuff are the people that chose to go with him in the pre-mortal life and now they're like you know they're sort of his tools and tempting us here on earth and stuff but as far as like the grudge have you seen that movie Mm -hmm. um, where like oh like I think it was like where they die you know, a horrific death or something and then like it creates like they can't move on and they haunt the world like I don't believe in anything like that um, yeah I don't believe in like oh a child fell in that well and now it, sometimes you can hear crying coming from the well and stuff like I don't believe that um, but that being said and I don't believe the whole thing of like the spirit is like trapped and can't move on or like the spirit is like stuck inside that house. What do you think? I don't know, dude. This is an interesting question. It's just, uh, I don't know. I, f I feel like that there can be just, I don't know that there can be evil that just exists some places. Yeah. Um, Obviously, there's evil people and people that do evil acts, but I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know. I feel like that if there was like lots of murders committed in in a house, well, it's just like a like things that weren't good happened here, and so it just has that a feeling. Yeah. Like a, bad feeling Actually, and maybe that's not e maybe that's not evil but it's just a hearing and non non-comforting feeling Actually, now that i think of it maybe maybe a place could be not haunted but like you know haunted kind of like there could be an evil influence there because i know um like i believe in blessing places like churches and temples and stuff they'll bless the ground and the building and mm -hmm. homes you know you bless your home or whatever to to like keep out bad influences and like make it a place of safety and refuge and stuff so 
Yeah, I think the way you said it could definitely be right. That like, if a lot of evil things were done in a place, or even not even a lot, but just like you know, bad things, it could in, sort of invite more evil, like a snowball effect kind of thing. Yeah, I think that's possible. So you just feel an evil presence when you go to that place. I think I'm starting to feel it now. Oh shoot, dude! <laughs> right. No more, no more conversation. <laughs> Sunshine and rainbows <laughs> and unicorns and flowers. Uh, yeah, dude. <clears throat> these, bo- these books are getting to me, dude. You no, know? I think that's uh, that's all. That's the that's all of it. Oh, that's a wrap, I guess.